Good morning. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Is the audio right on your side? Yes. Beautiful. Okay, great. It's so wonderful to finally meet you guys. Yeah, wow. we're so excited. It's been, it's been a, a bit of a tough one with your super busy schedule, but thank you so much for making the time. We're so excited to chat to you. Anytime. It's just a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. What a beautiful setting there. Where, whereabouts? Are you in your restaurant now in the like lobby or? I'm in one of the private dining rooms that we call the Tiffany room. So very cool. small and intimate. Um, this is one of the areas that's got the magical view over the, the Franklin Conservancy. So you can literally see the giraffes walking on the outside. No are you able way. To, are you able to turn the, <laughs> your computer magic. around? <laughs> <laughs> well, we can definitely try. It's a little bit far out. So <laughs> I don't know how it's, much you'll see, but they're there. <laughs> uh, wow, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> How's so, everything going today? Is it good? It's, it's magic. We've had an incredible weekend big, big function on Tuesday. So our cellar master was inducted into the uh, Commanderie de Bordeaux. Mm. So a very elitist group of, of wine fanatics across the globe. Wow. And they had the ceremony here. So that was how the week sort of started. And it's just getting busier Jeez. and busier. So on Saturday night, we've got the crew from MasterChef Australia coming to enjoy a meal. Oh, no way. So, yeah. <laughs> That's so, so cool. Do you ever feel like pressure when you cook? Do you know what? There's pressure every single day when you cook because mm. I've got so many guests and some of them actually book six to seven months in advance to celebrate a magical, um, you know, birthday celebration or anniversary or to get engaged here. So everyone yeah. comes to celebrate something special. And I really need to make sure that every single time that they, they have the event or experience that it's magical. So that, that is stressful every day. Of course. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So I, my um, my sisters uh, and her husband are like foodies. They live in Joburg, and um, I actually said, "Had you had you guys been to re restaurant Mosaic?" Because and they're like, "Oh, we've been trying to book a place there for like months. <laughs> it's like impossible to get in there." <laughs> well, it it has been a little bit crazy recently. I have to admit, um, and it's. I, I think because more, more people are now sort of anticipating that we'll be full, they do book longer in advance. Yeah. So we, we find that our waiting list is sort of, you know, getting longer and longer. So it's, it's almost like Sweet. a vicious cycle. Yeah, I'm, I'm not complaining, but shame for some of the guests I find, you know, because they want to celebrate something now, you know, they want to come out and yeah. experience Mosaic now, and now they have to wait six months, which, <laughs> which is a little bit hectic. Yes, it's such an amazing problem to have. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> it's the best problem to have. <laughs> oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. No, 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 This is normal. This is smooth. Can you it's hear not a, Can you, know, you hear the song playing? No. Is it your music playing? No, no. <laughs> no. Oh my god. Definitely yours. <laughs> okay, this, this is getting weirder by the second. Yeah. This is, we're gonna have a nice YouTube uh, backing <laughs> back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's so nice to hear um, some Afrikaans because uh, we I lived in uh, Holland for quite a long time and yeah. my Afrikaans basically disappeared and got replaced by Dutch. <laughs> and uh, it's um, it's just kind of it's so interesting to hear the Afrikaans again. It's cool. I dig it. <laughs> well, I was in Belgium last year doing yeah. um, a stage in the kitchen at Hof and Cliff, and it was really really wonderful because I ended up just speaking Afrikaans to everyone. We sort of communicated in between, yeah. and they were speaking a bit of Flemish, and so cool. it was it was it's, really really fun. That's <laughs> cool. Yeah, it's nice how you can connect. Like you only need you realize how little few words you actually need. Like yeah. you could just get away with like the, every third or fourth word and you like totally understand Pre what you're talking about. <laughs> Precisely. Even now while, while I was in France, you know, you had an entire kitchen full of people from Puerto Rico, you know, there's Spanish guys, Italian, and everyone's just communicating in this odd, bizarre <laughs> kitchen language. So, so cool. it's, it's pretty, fu pretty fun. <laughs> okay. So for Wine Spectator, we were awarded the, the best long wine list for Africa and Middle East, the best champagne wine list, the best sweet wine list, and then the best overall wine list. Cheapest. And we are one of only seven new additions to the Grand Awards. And obviously we are the only restaurant in South Africa. 
Wow, so it's, it's insane. It's a, a pretty, pretty big award. <laughs> Well, you're going to have to wow, say so that on, when we go on the show. Definitely, yeah. <laughs> we will definitely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, cool. awesome. Woo, how's it going, Gera? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's so funny, oh, man. We both went into it. <laughs> we kind of <laughs> stopped doing our woohoo because we thought we'd just start making it a bit more like, I don't know maybe professional or something like that you know <laughs> <laughs> we had some uh, listener feedback and uh, we always appreciate that and the one lady said it sounded a bit like a ghost and then we were like wow what are we, what are we doing <laughs> yeah exactly and then i was actually listening to a podcast this week and somebody else on you know the guys doing their intro they went woohoo and i was like no way is someone else does it too so, so maybe we need to pick it up again maybe we should ask you guys, what do you think? Send us back your your thoughts and uh, let us know if we should carry on with woohoo or not. <laughs> I think we may right go full circle. How are you, yeah. my friend? How's it? How's your morning going? It's going very well, thank you, bud. How about you? How's your evening? Yeah, great, man. I'm really excited to introduce introduce today's guest. Uh, we chatted to an amazing woman that combines her passion for food, her love for nature, and giving back in the most beautiful, artistic, and tasty of ways. Chantelle Dartnell is a multi-award winning chef and was voted the best lady chef literally on the planet. Chantelle combines classical French training and that love for nature and is also known for creating the art of nature on her plates with delightful botanical dishes. We also got into some really interesting topics. Hey, Gareth. Craig, we did. And Chantal was such a delight and a joy to speak with because she just had such a big smile on her face the whole time. And we really, really enjoyed it. We got through some really amazing topics. We talked about the wonderful healing benefits of food, how to make healthy tea concoctions using the flowers from your garden, the importance of sustainability and using foods in season, growing your own food, and then also using local suppliers. We spoke about how to maintain a healthy, positive and collaborative environment in the kitchen and how far a good attitude can get you in life. Chantal provides amazing opportunities for her staff and she upskills all of her staff. And she tells us how she helped her gardener and her cleaner to both become integral and award-winning members of her restaurant. We speak about how Michelin star ratings work and their fascinating history, which was both news to both of us. And we talk about the process of what it takes to become the world's number one female chef and also the best chef in South Africa overall. Chantal gives us a breakdown on how long it takes to create a new di dish and the number of hours she spends doing it. Uh, which includes researching, testing, tasting, measuring, and plating. And then we also touched on the abundance of edible plants and flowers in this world. And we finished off with like how chefing has changed over the years and how it has become an art and a whole gastronomic production. And it was a really awesome chat. And we also have a bit of housekeeping to go through today, don't we, Craig? Yeah, indeed. Um... Just uh, wanted to have a quick thank you. Um, we're blown away on a daily basis by stories of people that have been struggling with something in their life and, and through the stories of others um, have gained some kind of positive insight into their own situation. And so if you guys are enjoying these chats and you'd like someone else to hear these kinds of stories too, uh, one of the ways you can do that is to head over to Facebook and type in Ridiculously Human Podcast and like our page. Uh, in doing so, you'll be able to then see some stories come up and ones that you might resonate with you that you might want to share. So that'd mean a great deal to us. And this story with Chantel today, it also meant a great deal to us, hey Gareth? Yeah, it did, Craig. And it was such a proud moment for us, you know, as South Africans speaking to a South African lady, the world's number one lady chef in the world. And with all this sort of bad news that I guess is coming out of South Africa at the moment, it's so nice to, 
you know, speak to someone who's having such a positive impact and who still sees the world in such like a beautiful way and is just such a good image for South Africa. So it was a really proud moment for us to chat to Chantal and we're just really just so thankful for, you know, having that opportunity. Yeah, indeed, Gareth. And uh, I think now is a good time to actually get into this chat and hear exactly what makes Chantal Dartnell ridiculously human. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September to all right, we're here with Chantal Darton all the way in the Elansfontein, Pretoria. How's it going today? Very good in yourself, guys. Yeah, really good. Yours. Thanks, really good. It's right. nice to see your smiley uh, face. And, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're good. Like, yeah. Laugh. It's brilliant. Yeah, we hear you've got a view over some uh, African landscapes there, looking out at some giraffe and things. Oh, oh indeed. This is the oldest um, sort of little copies from the Mahalisberg. And there's some giraffes wow. roaming about on the outside and the, the zebras are also round about. So it's, it's absolutely <laughs> spectacular. And this time of year is for me magical because you've got all these buds coming out and everything is this luminous green. So it's, wow. it's fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> so do you actually go walking and like in the morning and see the animals? Or? Well, what I do, it's, it's a very short trek from my house. So if I don't have too many things to carry, I prefer just strolling up. It's literally like a three minute walk. Um, and it's, it's up a steep little hill, so it's good exercise. But then, literally, you'll have the nyalas and the giraffes walking on the, the dirt road, and they are so tame, so they don't even run, run away. So one of my chefs this morning actually showed me a little video she took of one of the nyalas coming to eat out of her hand. So they that Wow, that's yeah, it's, amazing. It's, eh? it's a little piece of paradise. Yeah. You don't realize how lucky you are growing up in South Africa, I guess, until you've left it. Eh? And like, there's just this magic element to it, especially when it comes to nature and animals. That's very true. Because when I worked in London, this was one of the first things that actually got to me. It's the fact that there's nowhere to escape to. There's nowhere where you have this peace and tranquility. And you can really connect with nature. And this was one of the most important aspects why I returned to South Africa. I've got a lot of people always asking me, oh, you know, are you ever going to move Mosaic? Will you ever go into town to be a little bit closer to people? And I'm like, do you know what? I love nature. I love being here. And I love taking people out of the city wow. to experience nature. Wow. So that's exactly part of the whole journey. You, you've, as an individual and as a restaurant and as a hotel, you guys have got an illustrious uh, list of amazing awards and just, I mean, it's just, an, sounds like it's such an amazing place, but I guess there's something special about just getting away from it all. And it's part of making the journey to get there for your, for your patrons, I guess, is part of the whole thing. Indeed. And this was the entire philosophy when we started Mosaic was to create this escape for sort of weary travelers who just really need to get away from it all. So our Wi-Fi reception is terrible. <laughs> reception is, is even worse. And it's, it's really just to get people to, to reconnect with, I think, you know, elements from nature that we, we entirely forget in our busy day-to-day -day lives. So that is why even the dishes at Mosaic. So let's get into a little bit of my philosophy where that came from. I want to portray botanical stories. And, and people always say, well, what is a botanical story? So the big master of botanical cuisine was Michel Bra. And he is set in this magical area in Aubrac, France. So you look out onto the plateau and he actually went into nature and sort of sketched on pieces of glass to get the reliefs and, and the atmosphere to bring that into his dishes. So what I do is I go out into nature, so walk along the beach, capture a little scene, and then try and recreate that scene that I captured in my mind on the plate to the guests. So you're looking at taste, texture, you know, flavors, aromas, but to awaken that sensation of literally having you walking on the beach and, you know, reminiscent almost of your own experience in that situation. Wow. It's wow. so fascinating. Craig and I were talking a little bit before this and we were really wondering, I guess, like where your inspiration came from uh, when you do cook and also 
how long it takes to actually create a new meal, you know, and what is the process involved? Because I can only imagine that, you know, you have this great idea in your head, uh, then you've got to go, okay, well, uh, what am I going to use? What, how yeah. am I going to source it? How many times do you have to make it? How many times do you have to retaste it? All these sort of things. I'd love to know more about that. So this is actually a, a, a very good question because some dishes are easy. You know, I get the idea. I go in the kitchen. I cook it once and everything just falls into place and it's, it's magic. And then there's those dishes. That's <laughs> a lot of effort, a lot of time. So there's one particular dish which uh, we're working on and I've, I've called it On the Vine. So this is a little secret information which we're launching on the brand, brand new spring menu, so on the Equinox. And while I was walking in the markets in Paris, they've got these beautiful vine tomatoes mm -hmm. and the smell of the tomatoes and they're sitting there on the little stems and it just looks magic. So I wanted to create that on the plate, but obviously not just have the tomato sitting there, but have a tomato that I've created that looks exactly like that tomato. Uh -huh. So we're playing with different textures and injecting them and actually pulping them, resetting them, re-dipping them. And that took a little bit of effort. So we're probably <laughs> in the, f <laughs> we're in the fifth session at the moment. And I think we're there. I'm happy. And I think the visual effect of the dish is, is phenomenal the taste is incredible and it, it sort of it pushes all of those expectations and it's something really really simple or well, it seems to be simple but it's entirely complicated so when you say wow. is your fifth session how many people are involved in these sessions and how long is a session <laughs> <laughs> okay so what normally happens is i have my inspirational session where i cook alone this is at my house i start in the morning and then I lose track of time. So sometimes I might finish 11 o'clock at night and then say, mm, okay, I'm happy with what I've done today. This is where I analyze my recipes. So make my notes, write down amounts, quantities, setting times. So all the practical information that needs to go into the dish. Because obviously for me to make it is, is one thing, but to get everyone else in the kitchen to be able to remake it, that is a little bit of a different um, project. So... For the tomato, I did two sessions alone before I was happy to bring it to my team. Then we set up a tasting session where everyone, so the entire chefing team, all the sommeliers, the management, every Tuesday we have our experimental day. So cool. I bring the dish in, I prepare it for them, we analyze the elements. Uh, the sommeliers team has the task. I send them an email two weeks before to say, this is what I'm cooking, this is what you're going to experience, and they each need to propose a wine. So we do the, the composition analysis of all of the flavors with the wines, mm -hmm. then select the wine, and then it gets to plating stage and final preparation and, and refinement. So it's, it's a lot of effort and a lot of work. So normally we have two big menu changes in a year. Um, and it's from the, the equinox to the equinox. So 22 March till 22 September. And then obviously within the season, there are different changes if something goes out of season. But the main, main menu is changed 22nd of September. Um, so literally once we've launched the new menu, we immediately start working on the next. It takes a good six months because each dish has a, a little story. So I tell you where my inspiration came from, um, you know, what the circumstances was. So just to give people a little bit of feedback. Um, there's one dish that I call Kaptonkul, which is such a great <laughs> Afrika Afrikaans word. I love it. Um, so this is, this is the name that was given to mackerel on the West Coast. So the one day I was on holiday walking next to the beach and there was these two fishermen sort of haggling, you know, joking together and they had this bucket of fish. And I walked past and I said, well, guys, what have you got here? And they were like, katonkel. And I was like, what, what is a katonkel? So I soon realized it was mackerel and then, wow, this is a cool story to sort of bring back to Mosaic. So we created the dish and, um, here we went back to sort of the old techniques of fermenting, pickling, preserving, uh, because roll mops um, is a, a very classical dish. But if you go to the Nordic cuisine, this is something that you find a lot, you know, serving raw fish, which is just pickled in marinade or, you know, cured in a bit of salt. And to tell that story of how our food has evolved and how all of these techniques of preservation have still come along and how we're implementing them today.
Mm. Wow. That was a bit of a mouthful. <laughs> no, no, brilliant. I love how you, okay. I, I, when you tell a story, I, I, it, it, it's so cool just to hear your personal experience and then you just, you totally just bring it back into the kitchen. Um, have you got other like interesting stories of, of specific dishes that you've made in the past that remind you of things specific from your youth or from, you know, earlier days or from family or? Well, we've got another dish that I call Fisk Kral. And this was inspired by the most beautiful piece of coastline by Kusi Bai, close to Mozambique. So what they have is these ancient fish traps where the fish are actually caught via the tides. So mm. they've got these old wooden traps where the fish then get, get caught in while the tide moves out. And then the guys just go and they harvest the fish naturally. So it's a very sustainable way of fishing. And I, I literally wanted to create that scene of making that fish trap. So this was another really interesting project. Um, so I, I went to, to Andrew, my sous chef, and said, this is what we're making. And she looked at me and she said, chef, you know what? Um, the, the things that you sometimes think, think about and come up with is crazy. But how are we going to make this work? Because we had to create a trap. Now, that sort of looks ethereal. It gives you the idea of these, these natural traps and then still have the fish sort of going into it and creating that scene. <laughs> so that, it came out beautifully. And every time we take that plate out, everyone's like, wow, it's so cool. Wow. <laughs> um, and then I think another dish which, which sort of really, really reflects an, an experience is um, tagine de Maghreb which is a little bit more Moroccan inspired. So we actually have this little tagine, which we send out. And then the thema bone we use to play the rest of the elements on. So oh. people have this, this raw bone with the most beautiful, delicate composition of pickled carrots and um, prune and, you know, duca spice, which we have with capretto, which is the young raised lamb. Because obviously oh. in Morocco, lamb is, is a very big dish. And we're using little bits of argan oil. So you're almost portraying that sensation that you have you know, while traveling, you're in this exotic country and I want to bring those flavors to the plate. Um, and I think that dish really captures it well. And then another one of my ultimate favorites, which we call the, uh, the flavors of Indushin. So inspired by my travels to the Far East. And this, this sort of brings in a lot of different elements. While I was traveling in Vietnam, they have a little street snack, which they call Ming Gum. Mm -hmm. uh, Ming Gum is like this explosion of flavors. They have a piece of spinach which they then put some chilies, uh, lime, ginger, um, ground up peanuts, and they just roll it like a little spring roll and you nibble on this. Mm. So I thought, wow, you know, the flavors of that is, is so light and fresh and invigorating that I wanted to bring it into a dish. And then one of my, my go-to, my always, I love cooking Thai food. Mm. So I wanted to bring that, that red curry into the dish and then Suckling piglets, I know it's baby animal, but it's, <laughs> it's super, super yummy. So bring the pig, on the one side, you've got this piglet in this red curry. Then the one element, we glaze the piglet in this like sweet, sticky soy sauce. And then we have this light, refreshing main gum. So here you have Cambodia, Vietnam, Thailand, Laos, all those experiences just rolled into one dish. Wow. And it is... It is truly yummy, <laughs> even What's if up? I may say so myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I'm like licking my lips here, going. Mm, I'm <laughs> they like they should piglet. find a way to sort of do these these long distance interviews, so I can send some smells and flavors yeah. to you. Uh, <laughs> make super, make us all hungry again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Super instant DHL. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so would you like your? Do you have a speciality like? A type of say cuisine like or is it always like a fusion of so many different cultures it's it's always a variety i think that's one of the names or the reasons why we decided on mosaic to give me the freedom um to be able to cook without any restrictions any restraint and also any stigma you know because i don't want to say i cook french cuisine or european cuisine you know i cook mosaic cuisine so it nice. is our own special identity um, even if you look at the the pictures of the dishes we create it's very hard to find another restaurant across the globe that you sort of say oh you know this dish looks like something i've seen there i think we've got a very sort of unique identity um, and this is something which has always been very important to me to create things that that is going to just make you sit back and say wow Okay, yeah. this is 
rather unusual um and and magical and fairy tale and yeah, just <laughs> it, <laughs> it is indeed like i mean I, I always look at your photos on insta and i almost wonder if you're a, you're a chef or like an artist you know because it's i mean i know the things are intertwined and and that, yeah i mean they are like pieces of art your dishes and I mean, yeah, well, they're incredible. Like the, the creativity is amazing. I love it. What has always been interesting is I've, I've always been surrounded by very creative artistic people. So painters and musicians and writers, but I've never been able to, to draw or paint myself. So I have this in me. I've, I've got this urge. I've bought canvases and, you know, easels <laughs> and I've really tried, but I am, I'm really bad. So I had to find another outlet, you know, something, that I could create art, uh, but in a different form. And, and food was just sort of the most natural vessel for me to explore. Um, I think the diversity, the colors, the textures, I have a larger palette to work with, I think, than most artists because mm. there's, there's no limitations. Mm. I, I have the, the, the biggest variety of vegetables, you know, textures of meats, of fishes, the, the, the endless amount of sources that you can create. So it's, it's just, wow. You know, I always say that the only limitations that we have as, as chefs is our own creativity and the limitations we have in our own minds. Mm, for sure. Wow. It must be so amazing for you. Now, I, I was wondering with your, with your such, you know, such an eclectic mix of uh, different kinds of dishes, did growing up in South Africa have an influence on that with, you know, so many different kinds of people and landscapes that was that an influence in your thinking and in your creativity? Definitely. Because having grown up here in Elensfontein, there's obviously a lot of the elements which surrounds me that is portrayed in the dish. So I had another dish, which we call African aromas and we used water buck. I have a lot of water back here roaming in, in the Franklin Conservancy, but we also have the red ivory tree, which has got really beautiful sweet berries. So we harvested and foraged those berries combined with the water buck. Um, for us, the smell here in Gauteng, the high felt, you've got this sudoering, acacia, mm. the, um, the beautiful trees. So when they burn in wintertime, everything just has this sweet sort of woody, mm. smoky smell. And I wanted to bring that that image through so a lot of our clients who travel from Europe and have that dish say wow you know this is almost the first thing they smelled when they got off the plane in winter time <laughs> um, here in Jovic this is what they experienced and this is now what they're getting on the plate so for me it's it's very important to look at what what have we got around us you know there's so many special ingredients that we have in South Africa that needs to be featured and this is this is our heritage so, you know this is where we came from we grew up with this so it's something that you relate to so using madumbis which is this this typical african root vegetable which has almost been forgotten you know people don't go out and into willies and buy them but there's yeah. sort of been this this new revolution and people are rediscovering these ingredients because i think more and more chefs are starting to to present them on the plates yeah, that's cool we were wondering if like South African cuisine has changed over the years, like in terms of say, you know, like how obviously our political system has changed. Has mm. there been like more of a sort of fusion of the two since then? Like, have we learned more about say, you know, black uh, traditional foods and stuff, or has it always kind of been there? I think it's always been there, but I think chefs now sort of have the, the freedom um, to explore it more and to, to present it on on their menus and on their plates. I think before people were a little bit sort of hesitant um, and didn't quite know how people would react to, to these foreign ingredients on, on the menus. So incorporating maroch and madumbis and, you know, mupani worms, I've not mm. quite gone that, that route yet. <laughs> but it, it is starting to feature in more and more of the top restaurants in, in the country. So I can definitely say there's, there's been a big evolution, but I think there's been an evolution, not just in South Africa, but in food in general. Mm -hmm. I think chefs, chefs have become more creative. They've become a little bit more daring. And I think we've, we've sort of pushed the boundaries and, and said there's, just, there's no limitations. Any ingredient can be made into something really, really beautiful and yummy. And I think chefs mm -hmm. are just exploring that more. Wow. 
Do you think now, there's been so, oh, sorry, Greg, you no, no. <laughs> do, do you think there's been any sort of chef in particular who's pushed the boundaries to to get it to where it is now? Like say, um, what's his name? Uh, Hester Blumenthal. Uh, Blumenthal. Uh, yeah. Blumenthal. Sorry. Um, <laughs> is it is is because I know he's kind of done a lot of stuff in the past. Is it, or has it just been like this? Right. Let's all kind of do it. I think the the one chef that I can really say started this thinking evolution or revolution was Ferran Adria. Now, the, the whole molecular gastronomy sort of movement uh, was very fashionable at one stage. And you had a lot of chefs, you know, making foams and jellies and spears. And, but I think it sort of toned down a little bit and chefs have retained elements from there. But the thinking behind it, you know, the questioning, the saying, how can we take something every day and make it into something extraordinary and unusual? It sort of started that thinking evolution. So we went from the classical Escoffier cuisine, where once again, he was known as, you know, one of the chefs that revolutionized the entire old cuisine because he sort of started the division of sauces. So that was the first step of of changing the thinking and and changing dishes. And then Ferran Adrian came and he was like, let's make it magical and spectacular. You know, let's take a dish that you've seen for 30, 50 years and make it into something which you've never seen, but it's still made with exactly the same ingredients. And I think with all of these evolutions, Heston Blumenthal, he's, he's sort of pushed the boundaries in a little bit of a different way, you know, because having um, edible wallpaper and... And then Christmas feasts <laughs> with weird and wonderful treasures. You know, it's, I think it's all getting people to be more involved um, in their food, but also food has become theater. You know, this has become the reality show. This has become people's escapism. And I think it is our duty as chefs, not only to, to fill people's stomachs because I don't think that's why they go to restaurants anymore. It's, it's mm-hmm. about the experience, you know, it's mm-hmm. about the chef being there, um, the people being able to interact with the chef, but also then going away saying, Oh, you know what? I had that dish that was, you know, on Instagram and got 12,000 likes and <laughs> people want that experience. <laughs> <laughs> so I think well, that's, that's what it's about nowadays. Yeah. It's certainly makes both of us just want to come and sit at, at one of your f- amazing 40 seats in your restaurants. And go and <laughs> but, you know, not, not to be, uh, this is not all about numbers, but uh, Heston Blumenthal is uh, five places behind you in the world rankings. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, uh, you, t- you totally went there. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> there's, obviously, there's a lot of different rating elements <laughs> and institutions are across the world so the best chef awards is is one of them um and yeah for me i think every chef is is individual and i find it a little bit difficult to sort of comprehend the fact that they can say you know you are number 32 and here's number 37 because for, for me even locally in south africa you know i would say that any of the the top 10 or top 20 awards should be, this is the top 20 spectacularly fabulous, talented people. No, we should celebrate all of them. You know, Michelin has almost got the right, the right way of doing it here because they say, these are my three Michelin star chefs. They're all chefs of exceptional quality. They excel in what they do. You know, this is our grouping of two Michelin star chefs. And because it's, it's very individual you know your experience at mosaic you know you might walk away and say wow you know this has been the most phenomenal experience of your life but somebody else might prefer something which is a little bit more contemporary a little bit more modern or way out you know if you go to noma um or the potluck club if you look at what luke dale roberts is doing in comparison to what we are doing at mosaic my food is very feminine there's lots of details. It's, it is, it's like a fantasy world on the plate where with Luke, you've got precision, you know, it's, it's linear and it's masculine and it's not necessarily going to appeal to the same person. So I think it's, it's very difficult to sort of say, this is where you are in the world ranking. But 
But you'll take number one chef in the world though every day, <laughs> won't you? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, actually, actually, I, just, I don't think we've been beating around the bush a little bit. We actually, you are the best female chef on the planet, yeah. which is <laughs> like ridiculous. So first of all, like what makes the woman that, how did you get to that point? Tell us a little bit about your journey getting, like what inspired you from a young age to ultimately end up in that amazing position? Well, I think something that's always driven me was ever since I was four, I've been intrigued by, by food. So my great, great grandfather was a, a chef for the Royal family. He was one of the pastry chefs. My mm. grandfather always loved cooking. My father's loved cooking. So I think it's something which is in our genes. Um, even my, my uncles, they all love to cook. But it, it seems to have always gone to the male side. So I was sort of the first, well, female, in, even in the family, to, to explore and to say, okay, I really want a restaurant because nobody's gone that route. They've all cooked open bakeries, you know, sort of done those things, but nobody's ventured over into opening a restaurant. But I said, at the time that I'm opening the restaurant, we need to do something which is going to set us apart from anyone else. We can't just open another restaurant, another country retreat. So the entire philosophy was to say, how can we make this so unique, so special and, and just so outrageously different? Um, and I think everything from our wine cellar, the interior, my team, because what's rather unusual is that most of my staff have come with me the entire journey. Hmm. So they started with me with hmm. almost no experience. Um, my, one of my head sommeliers now, Moses Morgaza, who recently received the award for the best server, um, he started as my gardener and wow. he's done the wow. entire journey. Um, so we trained him, we sent him on all of his courses. So one of the main <laughs> elements of Mosaic is this upliftment project to um, my, my junior maitre d' in my restaurant started as one of my cleaning ladies in the hotel huh. right, without any formal experience. And now she operates <laughs> and runs my restaurant for me. So I think it, it was all of us growing together. And what really, really sets Mosaic apart, I think, from a lot of restaurants is the fact that you walk in here and it's like entering a big family house. Um, you know, it's, it's fine dining, but it's not pretentious dining. It's, mm. it's dining with soul and emotion and having people, you know, feel welcome and, and comfortable. So, but also, you know, pulling on those heartstrings a bit and going back into memories. <laughs> yeah. I, I must say, like, it's amazing. I love. I love that. That's. It's. It. It feels like a family, you know. And and just what you've done, like growing, you know, and nurturing those people and training them is. It's absolutely beautiful. But it, it's so cool seeing like you with such a big smile and so much <laughs> energy and so happy because, like, you look at all these other sort of top chefs in the world and they're all like they're angry, Ser and they're serious, yeah. and they're serious, and it's like, and. You know, like working in their restaurants must be, yes, really difficult. But I can imagine you guys, prob I mean, even though it's super intense, you must still have quite yeah. a good plan. It, it is. And I have to say, even if you look at a busy, hectic service like we had on, on Tuesday night and everyone is stressed and you have all these high profile people, but obviously you need to impress. And then everyone was just going around hugging everyone and saying, oh, it's going to be okay. We're going to have a fantastic time. And after service, we was like, oh, we made it. You know, and uh, all yeah. the guests were happy. I think the atmosphere is just, it's really, really different. And it's, it's great. You know, one of the guests spoke to me and said, um, you know, was I ever a big Anthony Bourdain sort of supporter? Mm. And obviously both Anthony Bourdain and Mark P. White, they were like, the serious kitchen hellboys. You know, if you read their books and, and their representations of what a kitchen is like and, you know, the lifestyle of a chef, it's, it's very different from what I have and what we have at Mosaic. Um, we really try and have a balance and a quality of life and, you know, not have those harsh circumstances and environments where people can't function positively because yeah. one of the main things is that we portray the energy that we have within ourselves into the food, into our service. And if, if you have all of this negative energy, obviously it's going to, you know, flow through. But I think this is once again, something which 
has become a global awakening. You know, more and more chefs mm. are, are going the route of saying, do you know what? We really need to, to have a, a calmer environment. We need to respect our staff. And obviously there's some services where it's hectic and, you know, sort of tempers are running high and things need to happen quickly. But at the end of the day, you need to walk away, hug everyone and say, have a good night. Tomorrow's a new day. And, you know, I still love you. So yeah. it's, it's, it's basically being more humane towards one another. You yeah. know, you don't, you don't have to be mean and angry to be a chef. Um, oh, totally. <laughs> you can, you can reach the heights without, without being like that. Mm. Couldn't agree more. And we, we kind yeah. of feel the same way just about in general, the, you know, the way the world is going in general, not just in, in the, in chef within among chefs, but just in general, you know, people, see people where they're at as well and you know like you say like your gardener is now there you you don't know that guy's story like you don't know yeah. anything and 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 now look where he is and that's just a beautiful really beautiful story um and i suppose being surrounded by flowers uh, all the time must be calming effect <laughs> about uh, the botanicals and and what that is like ed- uh, to be honest with you edible flowers has been a a thing I don't know much about. I've always thought, why would you want to do that? So tell us yeah. a little bit about that aspect. Okay. So at, because I was in this very arty school, everyone turned vegetarian and it was the fashionable thing to do. So this was not for any religious reasons, but um, at the age of 14, I decided to become vegetarian. And my mom said, well, if you want to be a vegetarian, then you're totally going to cook for yourself because I'm not going to make other food, especially for you. <laughs> so, so this this sort of drove me to start my own um, herb garden, vegetable garden, and being surrounded by the herbs growing in season, you start seeing different elements of it. So it's not just the basil, but the basil has flowers. Mm. So then I started reading up about, you know, what does basil do to you? Not just by eating it but holistically you know why did they use basil in the past how was it used medicinally you know what what are the benefits what are the remedies because then you start looking at okay i'm going to brew my own barge tea because i'm a teenager and you know i need to clear my skin and you realize that oh barge is the most perfect thing to do this and i started reading up about random ingredients and then i started incorporating this into my daily life and when i started mosaic it was it was just the natural thing to do. It wasn't done anywhere else. And people were only using, you know, a little pansy or, you know, a carnation to garnish here and there or a a sprig of mint. But nobody was thinking about what does that sprig of mint actually contribute to the dish? So I started relaying that message saying, here is a day lily. You know, it's something which most people don't even know they can eat from their garden, which tastes 10 times better than any lettuce you can imagine, but it's 10 times healthier. It's got more vitamin C. It is an antioxidant. It is cancer fighting and you can have it in your food every single day. Um, So starting, you know, to create that awakening saying gardenia flowers, you know, these are the most (laughs) magical and mysterious flowers that has this exotic scent, but people don't think that they can pick them, brew them into a tea. You know, if you actually, eat the petals of the gardenia it it has the sensation of marshmallow now it's sort of soft and soft and squishy but the the flavor that you have you know every time i brew that that gardenia tea in the morning which is a fantastic digestion aid you know everyone's like wow it's just the most amazing thing that they've tasted and it's it's just getting people to connect with those elements so i i always say it's my job to create the awareness to say Every and each and every one of the, the flowers, the herbs that you have in your dish is there for a reason. So eat them. Trust me on your journey. I'm not going to put anything in there which is going <laughs> to be harmful. But if you eat enough of my fennel flowers throughout the meal and you have enough of, of the basil and we have enough fever few, then you know the absorption of the alcohol in your blood might feel a little bit less and you wake up tomorrow morning and you, your hangover is not quite as much so there's little elements that contribute to the way you feel while you eat um and i've had a lot of people saying wow you know we've just had a, a eight course meal which is you know actually 12 with all the little extra things but you know they they stand up from the table and they say we're full but 
we don't feel uncomfortable. Mm. Um, and this is that balance. And it's all these little elements that come into the experience that, that adds to the way you feel at the end. What's and your, that is, that's yeah. botanical cuisine. <laughs> yeah, that is. What's your, like, I guess, favorite medicinal uh, concoction? Well, we have a little brew that we make. The, uh, interestingly enough, the day lilies are phenomenal. So we actually put them into a plunger, pour some boiling water over, and they sit there and steep. And then we add a little bit of fennel, fennel flowers, star anise, and it becomes very – because – the day lilies almost become vegetal. It's like a vegetable stock wow. once it's brewed. So once you add the fennel and the basil and starnies, it's almost like this, this cleansing broth. Now this boosts your energy levels. It clears toxins out of your body. Um, it's sort of invigorating and it helps to, to beat any flu. Although this year I wasn't that successful with that one. <laughs> <laughs> Working too hard. <laughs> yeah. You know, Coming from warm European weather into South African winter time is <laughs> that that's the glitch. <laughs> so when you so day lilies, like literally the flower lilies, or the, is it, yeah the actual flower. The only thing you need to do is to pull out the stamen um, stamples in the middle because a lot of people show an allergic reaction to the pollen. <laughs> so once you've removed that, you have the entire flower. So the petals. Yeah. Um, wow. What is also interesting is you have different varieties of day lilies. So there's the standard ones, which is the yellow and red combination, which grows everywhere. And when you brew them, it, it makes this sort of bizarre purpley colored drink. Whereas if you brew the, the sort of more succulent yellow ones, they have a much more aromatic scent. And it's almost like this golden elixir that comes through and it's really, really sweet. So it's also, you know, focusing on, on which of the lilies um, has the best result at the end of the day. Even with, with little, um, you know, nasturtions or, or pansies. I always say pansies is made the most phenomenal thing because if you pick the white ones, their scent is the least aromatic. Um, although their, you know, their medicinal use is still the same. So it's also um, combating indigestion. It stimulates the blood flow. Most of the things that they do, you don't really want to discuss um, <laughs> over any any media platform but it's really good for you um, but the, the purple ones if we keep them in our little punnets and we open them up you know the smell is like releasing bubble gum into the kitchen and mm. once you have this this flowers and scents in a contained environment it almost you know activates your mind into creating new dishes new sources mm. new flavor components um, and that's another way of of sort of keeping inspired um, if, you, if you don't explore and you don't sort of, you know, push the boundaries to say, oh, we haven't done anything new. What other flowers are there? You know, where can we go next? Um, then you, you're not going to keep yeah. on discovering. Yes, really fascinating. <laughs> do, do, you, do you find that there's like a movement going more towards, say, like using plants and stuff more nowadays? Um, because it yeah. kind of feels like we lost touch for a while. Uh, definitely, because if you look, and I'm once again referring to the Nordic countries, their whole philosophy of foraging, going out in the woods, using a lot of the, the natural and wild herbs. In South Africa, I think a fabulous example is, is Chef Chris Erasmus at Foliage, who I think locally, um, he's got a little bit more of um, the approach where he goes into his environment and then forages the ingredients, where I select particular ingredients with the aim of of using them for a specific purpose in a dish so he goes out and there's wild peas and he'll pick them and on the menu today you'll have the wild peas but people in this sense are, are rediscovering as i mentioned before the forgotten elements which we used to use our, our great great grandparents you know used it every day mm -hmm. we just became too busy we we wanted the the convenience we wanted the speed we wanted to go into big supermarkets and mm. have stand rice apples and you know just buy a packet and everything looks exactly the same because it's all so neat and tidily packaged um and for that we've sort of lost our sense of nature we've lost the connection to mother nature and i think chefs are realizing that they need to return this is this is what makes us tick yeah. is what we have around us yeah, you spoke earlier of a few things, uh, Chantal, sustainability and 
uh, sourcing. Where, where do you get all your beautiful products? Are you, you, do, you, do you grow them in your backyard there? Your massive <laughs> backyard, or, or do you like, uh, or let's just say all your ingredients. Do you, you spoke about seasons as well. Uh, mm-hmm. Tell us a little bit how you go about finding your amazing ingredients. Okay, so we do have 280 hectares of pristine, mm. pristine countryside, but wow. we also have an extensive game collection on the farm. So originally we grew most of the flowers we used in the restaurant, and then the bookies decided <laughs> that they, they like foraging too. So yeah. they started coming in and eating my daylilies and, you know, <laughs> eating all the, the beautiful artichokes and cherry tomatoes that were growing. And I needed to decide, you know, am I going to put up fences and barriers and try and keep them out? Or am I going to embrace this? You know, say, let's share with nature. I still get to plant them. You know, they, they totally stimulate the growth. But look at local farmers that I can support as a chef. So when we started Mosaic, there wasn't that many people supplying the restaurant. Whereas now, 12 years down the line, I've got, four dedicated organic farmers that deliver to me three times a week. We've got um, a gentleman that, that rears our free range piglets. I've got somebody that brings in my, my goats, my Buddha booker, and it's all small scale. So nothing comes from, from big, you know, feedlots or, or big production companies. And we are really trying to get the smaller farmers, um, you know, to have a livelihood because I say the more and more chefs, who start buying from a particular supplier, they can expand, they can grow, um, you know, and then they also have their livelihood. So I almost felt like it's my responsibility as a chef Mm. to to support the farmers. So we try and have people within a 50 kilometer radius of the restaurant. Obviously, we have a very extensive cheese selection. So I would say we have 50% local and 50% European. So I have a lot of cheeses coming in from, um, well, from the Netherlands, we've got from Spain, there's a little bit from um, Italy, but a lot coming in from France because to a certain extent, my training was French and you know, people enjoy French cheeses. Mm. So, um, and there's also you know, other specialized ingredients. Our coastline, it's, it's become difficult to source sustainable fish locally in Gauteng. So it's easier for me to have scallops coming in from Ireland, which are fresh, unfrozen, than to have snook, which is caught (laughs) on the West Coast, brought to me. Um, So you also need to look at functionality and also the ultimate quality of of the ingredient. So as far as possible, we source local and from the farmers around us, but there are certain ingredients which we import. Wow. It's kind of sad in a way, isn't it? That you can't get yeah. like fresh snook like just around the corner. Exactly. You know, so on the one hand, I'm a little bit jealous of the restaurants down in the Cape and by the coast because they have that luxury. And I don't think people quite realize that. And you're like, well, they can put it on a little truck. You know, there are so many courier companies nowadays. But just because it's such a highly perishable product yeah. um, and there's not a very big market. You know, it, it, there's, there's certain challenges still that we face today, even with the, the major evolution that we've gone through in, in the food industry. You mean a challenge like people don't want to eat it or something? Yeah, or yeah. that there's not a market. So the guy says, mm, do you know what, it really, the transport and, you know, the infrastructure to bring 12 snooks up to Mosaic every week doesn't make sense. So I can give you a box of frozen snook, but, you know, it sort of defeats yeah. the purpose. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. It, it's interesting that you mentioned about like growing your own stuff. Um, I was in Brazil at the end of last year with my girlfriend and, and her grandmother is, is like a medicinal kind of uh, like doctor, I guess, in a way. And like she, yeah. like she ran basically her whole little village and like people would always come to her and she had like also like acres of land where she would grow Take all her plants and, and like give people these potions for all these different things. But the interesting thing was she was like, everything I grow, half is for me and the other half is for nature because yeah. the worms and the birds and whatever, they're going to want half of it. So the they, they are. They're <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But yeah, and, so, yeah. 
and everything is about balance and harmony. You know, we have to keep the equilibrium. So we can't just take from nature. We have to give back. Exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> and do you have, do you, like you went vegetarian. I'm, I'm assuming that sort of stopped at some point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> With my first, my first chef as a, well, my first job as a comic chef in, in London. So Nicola Dennis, he is, he was the big master. You know, so guys like Mark Pierre White, and they came from his kitchen. He wow. was a hard, hard taskmaster. So I started there straight from college, you know, very fresh. The only girl in this really male dominant, hectic, hectic kitchen. And um, he sliced a piece of, of foie gras terrine and he said, eat it. And I was like, I'm sorry, chef, I'm vegetarian. You know, it, it, it. and he was like, then you get on the next plane and you go home. He says, so either you convert and you stay in my kitchen or, or, or you go home. So that was sort of the definitive point where I had to sort of say, you know what, my entire career depends on this. And um, yeah, so from that point, I started eating meat again. You're like, and, ah. <laughs> <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> so, selectively, I have to say the one thing, and probably most South Africans say this, that you really miss is biltong. So <laughs> probably biltong and bacon. <laughs> but but, but the, rest, the, the rest, I don't mind too much. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So do you do you have like any thoughts, I guess, like on the kind of vegan movement and stuff now? Like, you know, I mean they they're all kind of really like loud and whatever, saying it's you have to eat this way and whatever, and you kinda of like, well, you know, no, you don't really because we haven't eaten like this our whole lives as a human yeah. existence. I think as with everything, and I might have already touched on the topic, it's about respect so respect for your ingredient respect for the animals um and also you know knowing where your ingredients come from i am i totally agree with the fact that there's a lot of horrific exper uh, you know conditions that animals are exposed to because of the masses and masses of food that needs to be produced for everyone across the globe um it, it would be the ideal if everybody could move to a more natural approach um and and really really create better conditions but unfortunately there's a big cash machine running behind this as well um and this is something that everybody realizes but not ev anyone really wants to talk about so yeah. there's been some some heartbreaking documentaries and stories and every time you watch one of these you know i i just say i i really understand and i totally want to convert myself and that is why my big focus at mosaic is to only buy and support producers and farmers who I know rear their animals in a good, kind way. Um, and for me, that makes sense. And it makes me proud and it makes me happy to have those ingredients on my menu. And I think the more and more chefs that implement this approach, you know, it will eventually start creating a change in people's, you know, mindsets. But not Unfortunately, this comes with a higher price. So people ask, why am I paying more if I go to a fine dining restaurant? You know, and the, the reason for this is we're buying from smaller farmers who are charging a little bit more because it's their circumstances is more difficult. You know, they don't have a big backing system. They don't grow tons and tons of carrots. This guy only has five kilos of carrots a week. If there's a flood or rains or if a bookie goes into his field, everything is destroyed. You know, so it's, it's bigger risks. Um, and with those bigger risks comes bigger investment and higher prices. So it's, it's a difficult topic to sort of get everyone mm -hmm. on the same page. And I think typically something that the TED Talks would love to get into or, you know, the sort of mad imposium, because this is what chefs are trying to create, but not all the chefs are on board. Yeah, yeah. It makes a lot of sense. Factory farming doesn't make sense anymore in this day and age. And there are ways to perhaps bridge a gap and still eat meat that's sort of done in a in a responsible way. I totally agree with that. How how would your how would you feel and what are your thoughts maybe on uh meat that's this is a sort of a new thing in technology where meat is being grown in the lab and, and in, in the nearish future that should be uh, for fairly cheap, 
to, you know, would you, would you use something like that in a, in a restaurant like yours? I would say it's a pretty contentious topic because my whole philosophy is that the animals should have had a good life. Um, and for me, that relates to being able to, you know, run around in the fields, you know, eating little bossies and, you know, just really being in touch with nature. So having an animal reared in a, in a lab, um, I don't see that at this point, maybe in 20 or 30 years from now, it might be financially sustainable. But I think at this point, it's probably going to cost 10 times more to achieve the same amount of food. So you have okay. to look at the pros, pros and cons and also what the effect is of that animal being with them. You know, what is that going to do to our bodies? Is there other foreign chemicals that is in the process that we don't even know about? Now, something which is, is really concerning is... is the, the amount of people nowadays being diagnosed with cancer and a big question I think on a lot of people's minds are why is this happening is there more toxins in our food is there more toxins in the water where are they coming from why are they building up on our bodies and I think the further you move away from nature the further you move away from a holistic and natural approach keeping it as plain and simple with as few chemicals and you know foreign elements this is how you're going to achieve the cleanest way of living. Um, so at this point, I, I would say I, I would not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, long, the long answer to your short question. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I was listening to this podcast recently. Um, it was with this guy. I, f I think his name was Dr. Joel Kahn, but um, he was talking about the issues that we have with our soil these days. And it was so interesting because actually this week there was a big uh, lawsuit, which sort of came, came to the front. Like there was a guy that sued um, one of the German companies and he got like $268 million because it, it had like, basically he, he could prove that it had um, caused cancer. For yeah. Him. So they talk about all the glycophosphate that's in our soil is like, that is actually almost the biggest thing to worry about yeah. out of everything. Never mind like factory farming and all these sort of things. So even the people that are eating veggies and all these type of things, they almost yeah. just, you know, you're just as like, that's what you, yeah, to get yeah. cancer and stuff from yeah. that. So yeah, that is why, you know, even people who are certified organic, you have to look at what the industries and the businesses around you are doing. Mm, it's very good yeah. and well to say I'm an organic farm, but the farmer next to me does not produce organic food because obviously it's going to drain through into the water table underneath mm. and there is going to be contamination. So it's, it's living and thinking and working together on a much larger scale. And yeah. th 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 that is, I think the challenge for our generation. This is the food There's challenge for, that we are facing now. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And just taking things a little bit um, personal again and into your <laughs> life, what what is what is a typical day look like in your kitchen at home? What what do you eat? Well, well, what I'm at the restaurant most of the times, most of the days. But if it's our day off, then we generally get up quite late. Uh, we love having a big family breakfast. So I'm not a big egg fan, strangely enough. You know, it's, it's hard for a chef to say, but I, I generally sort of avoid, avoid that. But, you know, toasted salamis with avocado and, you know, tomatoes and a, a good Buddha board, um, you know, that, that, that would sort of constitute, and Mrs. Ball's chutney, of course. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you, know, you, can't, you can't have breakfast without Mrs. Ball's chutney. Uh, but... If it's, if it's sort of a late Sunday night, we've finished the service, we only get home later, it's probably like a roasted chicken, a big salad and a ciabatta. So very plain, simple food. My go-to ultimate, as I mentioned before, if I'm really in a rush and I need to put dinner together quickly, but I want something fresh and healthy, I'd probably cook Thai. So it'll be a stir nice. fry or you know, a little red curry or something like that. But very simple, unlike what everyone thinks we do. <laughs> No, no, I think it's great. Like, like you said earlier, keeping things simple uh, is often just the best way, like a, a healthier way as well. Um, yeah. Obviously, you're not going to put a lot of your food is fairly simple in terms of it, its ingredients, but the way you make it is obviously not, but it's still earthy and 
and simple kinds of healthy foods, which is still really awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That, that is the, the essence at the end of the day. So yeah. can, can you just tell us a little bit about Michelin stars, right? How yeah. does it work and why is it <laughs> uh, so good? And what's the difference between one, two and three? And Okay. So the biggest question everyone always asks me is why do I not have a Michelin star? And it's because we don't have the Michelin rating in South Africa. Mm. So interestingly enough, there has to be a Michelin tire factory in the country because oh. this is, this is where the guide originated from. This is the Michelin, <laughs> the, the Michelin guide is related to Michelin tires because the guide was brought out for the, the chauffeurs and the butlers who in 120 years ago, you know, had to drive, drive their master from one little place to the next. And if they were on this road trip, you know, the butler had to know where they could stop for a good meal. So the tire, <laughs> the tire factory, when the vehicle was sold, issued this guide for the, the drivers and the, the chauffeurs where they could quickly read up and say, oh, okay, I can go here to find a good restaurant. I can take my master here, you know, to have a good little hotel. And <sighs> that is how it started. So the, the big difference in the guide is the one stars, this is a place that you can go to for a really good meal. So exceptional quality produce and exceptionally put together. When you go to your two star, this is a little bit more elegant dining. Your environment will be a little bit more refined. So you're probably looking at, um, well, also a contentious topic, but you know, there'll be linen and fine china and mm. probably regal glasses. Although nowadays there's a lot of Michelin restaurants that doesn't have any any linen on the tables. But that's why I say it's, it's contentious, but it's, it's a more elaborate, more elegant environment. And then for your three star, this is focusing on establishments where you don't only have a phenomenal talented chef where there's been a lot of care and attention to the detail of service, which means there'll be an exceptional sommelier. There'll also be, you know, a very incredible seller and everything around the restaurant. So from the point of taking the reservation right up to, you know, once the guests have left, uh, what's the little gift that goes with them? This is where the details coming in. And that's how the third star is obtained. Oh, so it's, <laughs> so they say, you know, the Michelin restaurant. Um, so your one star is a restaurant that is, is worth a detour. Two star is, is worth a journey. And then, you know, your three stars, this is worth, you know, yeah. a, a serious, serious flight and road trip. <laughs> wow, that's do amazing. Think, do you like feel as though like you wish that you could be on that list just to know where your, where your restaurant would be at? Or are you quite comfortable just, you know, within yourself? Do you know, I really quite enjoy the fact that we don't have the Michelin rating in South Africa. Because for me at Mosaic, I've always said our ultimate focus is creating that unforgettable experience for everyone that walks through the store. So there's no differential treatment between, you know, Craig is coming tonight or Marie is coming tonight. It's the same service for everybody. And for me, the greatest reward is having a little letter the next day from somebody saying, do you know what, Chantal? Thank you so much. This was mind-blowing we loved every moment and i tell my staff we're not here to be chasing the awards um we need to do everything that we do because we love what we do and we're doing it with passion and the only thing that needs to inspire us is to say how can we make that experience that we just gave to this client better if that client came back two weeks from now because if you hear the first time, it's everything is new and everything is magical. You come back a second time, you start noticing other little details. You come back a third, a fourth, a fifth time, you know, and it's almost like the first magic, the first, you know, the interior and everything that could overwhelm, you've become used to. So we need to keep wowing you with our food, our service, and all of the other effort that goes into that. And that is how 
I always say we keep reaching the goals and the, the heights. It's fabulous to be sort of rewarded for those efforts and to be noticed. And people say, you know, wow, they have an incredible seller and they are achieving phenomenal um, awards. But I find if Michelin would be here and we would be given a third star, although our focus would still be on making our clients happy, I think the additional stress that you have to work towards maintaining that star puts a different element um, into the authenticity yeah. of, of the service. So, it's, so I find that it's, it would probably complicate matters a little, you know, because you would be pushing keeping that third star rather than pushing just keeping your, yeah. your own vision. Yeah, it's kind of nice to staying <laughs> under the radar a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and, Sounds and, bizarre, but it's true. <laughs> <laughs> and you mentioned uh, Sela and awards, and you guys recently got some amazing awards in terms of your Sela and your uh, sommelier as well got an amazing award too. Would you like to tell us a bit about that? Yes, yeah, so at the, um, the Eat Out Awards last year, um, Moses Mogwaza, who I spoke about earlier, he was awarded um, the best server and sommelier, which for somebody with that humble background was a major, major yes. achievement. We received the, the Wine Spectator. This is the international American publication. Uh, mm. We received their, their grand award. So we are, there's seven new restaurants in the world and we are the only restaurant in South Africa to have ever received the grand award so this is for the best entire wine list the best long wine list best champagne selection and best sweet wine selection so it's yes. it's a pretty we basically have the best seller in africa and the middle east um, wow. so that's uh, it's it's pretty 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 big <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's proud, big or it's just really good like it's it's really good so it they don't they Although the award is for the best long wine list, they focus on the variation and the depth that you have in your cellar. So we are in South Africa, so obviously we need to have a good representation of you know, the wines that is locally produced. But then also, if you're looking at Burgundy or Bordeaux, you know, which areas do we focus on? How many vintages have we got? So if we would present a tasting, are we going to be presenting a tasting with 11 or 12 different vintages of a particular wine and this is what makes it interesting so it's not just having you know chateau rias or a petrus but having you know even van de constance we have the entire collection of van de constance that was produced in south africa so there's no vintage which is excluded and we are the only restaurant that has that selection um, and that is what makes us special <laughs> <laughs> and that must i mean that must be a whole lifetime's passion in and of itself. Well, this is why it's so wonderful working with my parents uh, because their passion for what we do, it all comes together. So Kobus, my, my dad, he, he is the one who's passionate about the architecture, you know, the art, the seller. So he's our seller master, the secret seller master. And he's just been, you know, inducted in the Commanderie de Bordeaux which is um, a phenomenal elitist <laughs> group of, of wine enthusiasts. So we had that function this week and he's the one who sort of led us to achieve these heights in the wine. He does an incredible amount of research um, and the time that goes into putting our wine list together, <laughs> making sure that the wine, the width, the variety, everything that goes in is, it's a, it's a full-time hard job mm. so i would not have been able to to achieve that if it was not for him um so that is the wine so that's entirely you know he's cherry on on the cake and my mom being in the restaurant with me um you know her enthusiasm her passion um and her sort of motherly instincts is is what makes this place tick um she's a stern taskmaster so all of the <laughs> staff know my mom is 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 very petite <laughs> And looks incredibly sweet, but you know she runs this place with an iron, <laughs> iron fist. Um, and I think this is sort of what it what makes it magical. You know, everyone knows the family, um, and we work together as a family. So it's pretty just, special. Just before you move on from that, just tell us a little bit about the Orient then itself. 
Yeah. So the reason why the hotel was called the Orient is because my mum and Chris went on holiday and they ended up in Morocco. And my mum saw this beautiful little village and she was like, wow, it would be so special to be able to see this view every single day. She was like, this is one of the most magical moments of my life. So Kubis came back. Um, we had to start the project of developing Mosaic. And at that stage, I just said, I wanted a restaurant in the countryside and I wanted it here where I grew up. So because the, the farm had a property that was vacant, Kubis started developing that. And he designed, he did the architecture and sort of reconstructed the building that was here to look like this beautiful Moorish little village. And he wanted it to blend with the African sort of landscapes and colors and tones. And that is how the Orient actually then came about. So you've got this, this magical, I don't want to say Moroccan ambiance because it is really Oriental. There's elements from Spain, India, um, Morocco, even French elements that all came together into this building. So everything is selected, handpicked, there, there's no big interior company that came in and, you know, sort of wow. clad, up, clad up the hotel. Everything was, was handpicked and everything has got a story and everything has a personal emotion attached to it in the hotel. So it's really like walking into our home and, you know, all the pieces here tell you a story. Wow. That's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> and so just to, uh, just to also go back a bit to the, um, the award that, that you won and, and, You've won the Best Chef Award, is it twice? Or you, you won it in 2017? And... Um, so there's actually, there's different ones. So yeah. the award that I won last year, this is the Best Lady Chef. Best Lady <laughs> Chef, yeah, yeah. La Lady Chef, so that was for the Best Chef Awards. And then in South Africa, I've received the title of the Best Chef twice. Wow. So the first time, the first time was in 2009, which I really thought was pretty early in my career because... I had opened the restaurant in 2006. So I was very young. Um, and mm. I, th I think it took us a while to sort of establish our personality because it was so different and individual. So when the judges arrived, I think because it was just so unique, they saw, okay, this is, you know, a young lady that's got great talent, you know, already then our wine cellar was, was very well established. And they said, well, there you go. The title is yours. And I was like, oh my goodness, you know, we can't receive this within three years or opening it. it so it, it was magic, but it felt a little bit unreal. So the next time that we, or that I was awarded the title of the best chef was in 20, 2014. I don't know. 2014 or 2015. <laughs> There's the, been so many awards. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it was, it was, much later and i had felt that it was much more deserved because we had come a long way we'd really grown into our vision and who we were and at that point i felt okay we deserved the award um so everything up to then has been an incredible incredible journey um and it's always great to sort of have people notice i think the uniqueness of mosaic mm -hmm. and i think that's what making what's making people sit up and say okay let's pinpoint that young lady you know in the far side of pretoria in south africa um because a lot of the people are sitting up saying well you know who is chantal who is mosaic yeah why why do we not know of her um and i think this is a story which is going to continue um i'm excited about what what lies ahead and what we can still achieve and and reach and how to keep it interesting and and what is it like yeah. like going through the process to win the best woman chef in the world award like so, is it, so this is actually yeah. an interesting an interesting award for um the best chef in south africa you have judges coming out to your restaurant they judge you throughout the year um they're anonymous so you don't know who they are for the best chef award you actually get nominated by your peers so by other chefs in the industry and what happens then is food journalists judges bloggers um, all the major culinary magazines they all get to vote for the chefs so it's almost like an algorithm that they have at the beginning to sort of pick the chefs 
So they look at what you do on social media, what your TripAdvisor reviews are, what your Google rating is. So they literally do an intense background check on you <laughs> to see if you qualify. And then it's, it's up to the votes. So at the end of the day, it's the votes that count. So there's no wow. cookout. There's that no is. big, there's, there's no big get together and there's, there's no, you know, serious knife sharpening. And um, they just focus on every aspect, your entire philosophy. What is the message that you portray? Um, you know, and, and what is the total sort of effect of your restaurant socially and globally? Wow. You got that. And are, there so more, are, there, are there more and more, um, lady chef competition <laughs> or competitors should i say is it is that something that's it's, uh, getting there it's still pretty limited um actually for for women's day i've had a lot of people asking me what is the relevance of having a different award for men and women um you know, because on the one hand i feel that we are all equal uh, you know, we might not be able to pick up as heavy parts as the guys, but we certainly try. So it's, it's not that, you know, we're not working as hard or there's discrimination. I just think there's fewer lady chefs because of, you know, family obligations. I think a lot of women have the aspiration of becoming serious chefs, but they also, you know, want to be a mum and they want to be part of their families. And the, the, the time that you need to put in every day into a restaurant, especially at this this level is it, it puts a big, big demand on, on you personally. Now there are three Michelin star lady chefs. You have Anne-Sophie Pick, Elena Azak, who have successful families and kids, Margot Janse, and you know, uh -huh. they have, they have it all and they are, they are doing this and they are making it work. So it's not an impossibility. And I think pretty soon, there is going to be a point where we're going to get to ladies just being put under one, you know, category and that's it. So men and, and women will all be seen equally um, because I think you, well, I've certainly noticed that there's more and more young ladies getting into the industry and there's fewer and fewer young men chef, which is enrolling into chefing schools. So it's almost like there's mm. been this major turnaround in the industry and so it'll be interesting to see what happens in the future. But I think at this point, they, people still feel that we need to be distinguished. Because if you look at, there was 18 lady chefs in the, the top 300 running, which of 300, only 18 ladies is a very limited group. So, yeah. but we're getting there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's really interesting because I actually did a um, chefing diploma this last year. And uh, out of 18 people, I was the only guy in the class. <laughs> yeah. See, and, so yeah. there's definitely, there's definitely a, change, a change happening. It's not, it's not a men's world anymore. Um, and it's definitely not a male-oriented profession anymore. So I think more and more ladies are realizing this fact. Um, and that is why they're moving into the industry. Yeah. And what about uh, the, another breaking, another stereotype is um, you certainly not overweight. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> never trust. <and> step. <laughs> well, that is definitely something which has sort of gone out the door because nowadays, if you look at most chefs, I would say 90% of the chefs are really, really sort of fit. They're looking at what they're eating. And they've moved away from the stigma of you need to be yeah. you know, a little bit overweight to be a really good chef because health has become a big, a big factor. You know, people are wanting to live healthier lives. If you're overweight, you're not as, you know, energetic. It's harder to move around in the kitchen. It is hot. So, you know, obviously it makes the physical effort that you have to put into the kitchen harder yeah. and harder. So chefs are really aiming to, to live healthier lives. Um, you know, I'm not a big fan of exercise, although I know all the benefits around it, but the job is, is rather physical and we have a lot of steps all over the hotel. So I think I get in my fair share of exercise, <laughs> but I think it's, it's all about balance and also, you know, how you look after yourself the quality of the food also that we're cooking has changed. So for me, what I put on my plate needs to be healthy and 
lean and clean um, almost. So if this is what you're cooking and this is what you're tasting every day, the, yeah. you know, you are what you eat at the end of the day. So That's I true. think <laughs> I think that is why chefs are becoming leaner. That's good. Uh, and I, I've seen as well that like recently you were in um, some other amazing chefs restaurants in Paris. Oh and yeah. <laughs> what's it like going into another chef's kitchen? Are you kind of judgmental? Are you really open-minded? Are they like, you must do this Chantal? <laughs> what <is it> like? <laughs> do you, what's really interesting is if I write to them to say, I want to come and spend some time in the kitchen. It's almost like most of them don't quite, you know, know who you are, or where you come from. So they think I'm a young chef who's come to spend a few weeks in the kitchen or a few days in the kitchen. And I get treated like any one of the other <laughs> chefs in the kitchen. So wow. I walk in there, um, I get a prep list, which contains peeling garlic, chopping onions, you know, <laughs> chopping the parsley. And you literally work like any of the other chefs work in that environment and that is what makes it magic for me because i want to see how that kitchen operates mm. you know I, w I want to see how the dynamica works how the entire team gets together and this is the reason why i do this you know because it's nice to be in your own environment but you almost become comfortable and you need to continue pushing the boundary seeing what is out there what what are other chefs doing? You know, maybe there's a piece of equipment that I've never, never encountered that I get to see in operation in another kitchen. And I'm like, oh, okay, this could actually make my life a little bit easier. Or it could change the way we work. You know, we could, we could work a little bit more, you know, cleverly. So this is how you keep on pushing those boundaries. Now, being in that kitchen is an entirely different experience than being in the restaurant. Because in the back, you get to see, once again, the energy that goes into the food. But when I go to a restaurant, I'm always very open-minded because for me, I'm also there to relax. I'm also there to have a phenomenal meal because I really love to eat. I love food. So, <laughs> you know, that is the ultimate experience. Sometimes, you know, I stand in my kitchen. It's been a long time since we've traveled. And I really crave sitting down and I'm just having beautiful food prepared for me because <laughs> I very seldomly have the opportunity to sit down in my own restaurant. I never have the opportunity to sit down in my own restaurant <laughs> and eat. <laughs> so it's nice to be treated and to be spoiled. So that is how I experience it. It is for me a magical treat. And you know, you just you sit there and you appreciate the talent of the chef. It's not sitting there analyzing every dish and saying, oh, you know, I would have done this or done, mm. done that. It's really about the enjoyment of the moment. And do you ever end like say a few days with them and, and they go, Oh, hang on. We, we know who you are. <laughs> You're the best chef in the world. <laughs> sure. it, it, it normally takes about three days because the first day in the kitchen, everyone's always scared to talk to you, you know? So you, you're the new girl. Yeah. So you stand there normally, normally amongst the other new intakes into the kitchen. So, and they, they tell you about their college experience or their aspirations of being a chef. And, you know, people generally think I'm a little bit younger than I am. So, you know, they want to know, oh, so, you know, how long have you been in the industry and where have you been <laughs> cooking? And normally when I say, well, I, I have my own restaurant. And they're like, wow, you know, where and how long? And if I start telling them the story and you know, then they're like, oh, can you show us pictures in the break? And normally by that stage, you know, the message Sort of Google's starts happened. <laughs> cy ciphering through in its Instagram account, and they're like, "Oh my goodness! Okay, this is actually who she is." So, <laughs> um, but but then it's more about you know camaraderie, and people start asking questions, and then like, "Oh, on my next travel to South Africa, can I come and spend a few days with you in the kitchen?" That's cool. And this yeah. is this is how the networking happens. So wow. I've had some of the chefs, the young guys coming through, and some of my guys going to kitchens abroad. And this is what is necessary. It's movement of ideas, movement of energy, and, mm. you know, creativity. So that it, that's what makes it fun. Collaboration cool. is so important, isn't it? Yeah. It, it is indeed, you know, because I think you can only really achieve your greatest heights if you know the creativity of the people around you. So mm. um, in South Africa, we have a very close-knit community but that is what people are exposed to. So as soon as you start traveling abroad and you see the quality and the standard of the food, the plating, the service, everything that they present there, you almost realize that 
okay, what we have achieved up to now, we really need to up and get to the next level. And this is one of the reasons why we travel every year is to sort of stay relevant, stay in touch with what is happening, not just locally, but globally and keeping in touch with that. I'm, I'm not a follower of, of food, fashion and trends. I've always stuck to the fact that we produce botanical cuisine. I use edible flowers and have a look at the holistic approach. So I've never changed that view, but it's interesting to see the evolution that you have in other chefs and restaurants and sometimes how they move from one extreme style of cooking to a next according to how the fashion in the industry changes so classic and it's and th- it's interesting yeah for sure did you actually study anything um like like in terms of the botanics of plants or is it literally you've self-taught yourself it's 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 self-study so wow. i have a very extensive uh, book collection <laughs> Um, which I, I really, really love, but also not just in books, the, the internet. This was something, okay, when I did the school projects, we still had to go to the library. So the internet, <laughs> the internet did not quite exist then. So this is something that's come later. But, you know, Margaret Roberts in South Africa was a big driving force. She wrote a lot of incredible books on on herbs, their medicinal properties, you know, the edible herbs, which a lot of people didn't know. So I started discovering her books, going into the older books that she's written. A lot of my books come from, you know, the ancient English botany, um, you know, and the herbalists, and even into a little bit of the, the pagan Wiccan history, um, discovering some of the forgotten flowers through those ways. So it's about a lot of reading up, you know, discovering and then just opening your mind. Uh, you know, it's so, so exciting. About <laughs> you, you, you guys are quiet. <laughs> <laughs> mesmerized. <laughs> yeah, we were mesmerized. Yeah. When, when, you, when you go deep in a subject like that, all the other things you learn are also so interesting, aren't they? I'm sure you've learned just so many like little mini tangents about from learning about those plants and then something about wow that bit of history or this person it must be really interesting and you probably yeah just and how it, how it all all comes together you know sometimes as you say you discover little things which you don't seem it doesn't seem relevant at that point in time but then five five years down the line you in a conversation and the topic comes up and then you realize wow you know i have this bit of information that i can actually yeah. share and it is it's quite brilliant so that's yeah, so cool. no, it's it's always about enriching your mind. Yeah, for sure. Constant learning is important. Yeah, indeed. And, and I guess, like in terms of yourself and the restaurants, what what can we sort of expect from you, like in the future? Is there any cool things coming up? Well, our big project at the moment is actually nothing that's food related. So we're opening a a second museum on the property. So the first cool. museum that we have is a, a bronze a bronze museum for the artist Tinny Pritchard. Now Tinny Pritchard is still alive. He is in his eighties, but phenomenally talented. And we, as much as we celebrate food and wine, we also celebrate art. So the next museum um, is the first wing that we're opening is for Adrian Bossif, who. In the room I'm sitting, I'm surrounded by his paintings. So really, really beautiful impressionist art, um, oh, wow. or rom- romantic impressionism. And then the other artist that we collected is, is South African artist, but also from the impressionist um, reign. So we've got Alexander Rose Innes, Tito Fischotti, um, you know, Gregoire Bunzaya. So the entire museum is our private collection that we've, we've sort of put together over many, many years but that we want people to experience so that they can realize the talent uh, that we have in the country, which is very seldomly, there's not enough museums to feature, to feature South African artists. And I think, you know, it's sort of our job. If you, if you have means and you're exposed to the artist, you know, to get more people knowledgeable on the topic. Wow. So So that's, that's, that's the big, the big project. But for me and Mosaic, um, my team and I sat together the other day and said, okay, so where do we go from, from here? And it's still just keeping it authentic, moving on, creating, creating dishes that has not been seen before. And this is our challenge because 
I always say everything has been cooked. Everything has been created. You know, it has been done before. The only challenge is putting our, our own personal interpretation on it. So it's finding the uniqueness in dishes that um, aspires us to keep on creating. That's so amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and if um, all of our listeners want to get hold of you, what's the best way for them to sort of like follow you on social media? And, and if they want to like obviously make bookings at the restaurant or come stay at the hotel? Well, the best way to, to make a reservation is definitely to go via the, the website. So the hotel and the restaurant websites are separate from one another, but you can access the hotel via the restaurant website. So www.restaurantmosaic.com. The, my social media, I'm at Restaurant Mosaic at the Orient, which is a very long, long name, I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but if you put in Chantal Dartnell, you normally get to my Instagram and to my Facebook pages. And you could like us. I'm unfortunately in that respect a typical chef. So I'm not super active on social media. I know I should be. We're, you know, in the modern age. But we try and post as much as possible and keep everybody updated with what we're doing. And um, as soon as we have the brand new photo shoot for the menu, those will be released pretty soon. Sweet. Well, it's <laughs> certainly beautiful to to just take a moment to browse through through there. And you've also got one or two nice little videos on youtube and stuff that people should definitely check out because they they just give you that that feeling of of what your your big why 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 you do what you do and you've obviously exposed us to that a little bit now but uh, there's obviously lots of interesting especially to see some of the views of to get a sense for for people listening overseas you know what how beautiful it is there that i think that's really special yeah. so yeah so thank you so much you know for for that it's just beautiful yeah it's a great pleasure. The, the YouTube videos that we posted was a lot of fun, you know, so bringing people into the mosaic kitchen, sharing our recipes, plating um, the cut, which is unfortunately uh, mostly Afrikaans based. So we've had five seasons with them now and they all on my website. So if you access media, all those little short snippets, three minutes are on there. But now the new season of the cut is actually, um, they've got, English subtitles under the program. <laughs> and this is the newest little snippets which I post every week to say on the cut this week we'll be preparing. So you've got this brief intro of the dish, a little bit of the surroundings, but also you get to see the restaurant. So that is awesome. a lot of fun. That's and so it keeps me out of out of trouble. So <laughs> <laughs> Chantal, just before I say thank you, um don't don't you think that a story told in Afrikaans is just so much more descriptive and better than a story told in English? I, I do, because there's words in Afrikaans that just is almost mind boggling. And people sit there and especially if I tell even the menu in Afrikaans, <laughs> Afrikaans speaking people would look at me and say, my goodness, this, you know, this sounded just mm. 10 times more exotic than it really is. Because one word, <laughs> if you look at Jakob's muscles, you know, a scallop, <laughs> yeah. you know, for most people, a scallop is a scallop. But as soon as you say Jakob's muscle, it just it gets this magicness. Um, so I think there there are a lot of words in Afrikaans which is very expressive yeah. and just gives a totally more authentic slam to to stories. But I also think it it's got a lot to do with the the culture of our people and our yeah. personalities and the beautiful sunshine. And it all comes together in the stories that it's told. Mm, for sure, yeah. <laughs> I always thought like a joke in Afrikaans was like ten times as funny as it was told in <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, it was just love hearing Afrikaans jokes. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I just wanted to say massive thank you, uh, you know, from me. Like, I, I was just sort of mesmerized by this whole chat. Um, and are you there? I'm here. My oh. battery is just is going low. Sorry. Oh, okay. Is that battery on, on your phone or on your on on my camera on my my ipad so uh, i'm on 10 percent. okay cool all right we, we good we'll finish off in a minute okay <laughs> you know, Not at all. So, so i just wanted to say like massive thank you um firstly for like the energy you brought to this chat and just having like such a big smile is like <laughs> so easy to chat to somebody and so fun to chat to somebody and oh. i can imagine that's what it must be like i guess in your restaurant uh, from the moment you walk into the moment you guys leave, uh, which is 
probably because he's why he's so successful, you know, like creating that awesome sense of community and doing things in a fun way is just so important uh, that I think a, a lot of people miss out on. And oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for the compliment. <laughs> no, no worries. But yeah, it was like the chat, the chat was just really interesting. You, you've kind of got my juices going, like, you know, thinking more about how I can use plants in like a, you know, a more meaningful yeah. way um, and not just looking at them like something pretty. Um, yeah. And then also just making me want to be more, more experimental with my food, you know, because it literally is there to be played with, I guess, you know, to... In Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, but it was just a, a, a great chat. I really love how you are representing South Africa to um, it's so important and uh, it's so nice to see that you're doing so well. Um, and as a South African, it makes me feel really, really proud. Um, so thank you so much for your time and thank you so much for smiling and <laughs> being a lot of fun. <laughs> it's a great, just briefly, great pleasure. Thank before you. Before we finish off um, from my side, Chantal, like just real briefly, Gareth said it really well, but one thing that I just realized is like when someone is so passionate and a family is so passionate, people will come and it's just such a cool lesson because in reality, you're in the middle of nowhere, really. You know what I mean? Really. Um, it's, an, it's an effort to get to Mosaic. People really yeah. want to come here. Um, and you don't just you've have got an occasional... A, yeah, and you've got a decent waiting list. And, yeah. But yet, people are like flocking to your space. And for me, that's also just a real inspiration. Is like if, if you're exuding something um, unique and special and genuine people uh gravitate to that and yeah. uh just like Gareth said as well uh you know just so much excitement so like we should be more excited about trying things and moving forward like let's just make things work together and have a good time while you're working like yeah. what a positive message so so just thanks so much for that as well and, and thanks for your time today and thank you for you guys. It was spectacular. I know this was long overdue, but <laughs> definite, definitely worth the wait. So thank yeah. you for your time as well today. Cool. Thanks and I lot. really hope that we have the pleasure to welcome you at Mosaic one day. I'll well, do that. Well, congratulations on, on your engagement in the marriage. Thank you. That's, that's thank super you. exciting news. A girl but from we, Wooster. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Local is lacquer, no? Yeah, exactly. exactly. All right, well, thank you so much and cool. enjoy the rest of your day. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour, and up in the air, stop at the toll.